And verse number 26. The scripture said, And he said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, wilt give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, I'm Jehovah, that healeth thee. This is his covenant relationship with his people. And he told them, If you be obedient, I'll keep you well. The obedience, therefore, is the only thing necessary. Under this dispensation, God said, no sickness. Deuteronomy chapter number 7 and verse number 15, the scripture says, And the Lord will take away from thee all sickness, and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt, which thou knowest, upon thee, but will lay them upon all them that hate thee. So it's obvious the Lord would could... Uh, we, could inflict sickness. That goes without saying. He smote Miriam from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet with leprosy because she, along with others, had rebelled against Moses and against his authority. And you know what happened to uh, Uzziah the king when he usurped the office of the priest and went into the, went into the holy place? God smote him with leprosy. In Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 58, it says this, if thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God, then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful, and plagues of thy seed, even great plagues, and of long continuance, and sore sicknesses, and of long continuances. Continuance. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt, which thou wast afraid of. And they shall cleave unto thee also every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this law, them will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. Now that's some pretty straight stuff there. The Lord says, I will bring this on you if you rebel against me. So when the Lord said, I'll send you the former rain, the latter rain, protect you, send you the rain at due season, give you the crops, keep you protected from your enemies. And then keep all these diseases off of you. It paid to serve the Lord, didn't it? Amen. You live under that covenant relationship with the Lord. He said, I'll take care of you. Now, that's under the law, folks. That's what we call the law, the law of Moses. And uh, the law, you know, is given at Sinai. And when Israel came under the law, they came under the protecting hand of God. It was not something that just arbitrarily was issued if they chose. It's something God gave them. He gave them His protection. Now turn to Matthew chapter 13, verse 57. Fast forward about 1,400 years. 1,400 years into the future, look what we've got. Matthew 13, 57. And they were offended in him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of what? There was a limiting factor involved here. Could the Lord Jesus Christ by his own power have done anything? If he'd chosen to, he could have it. He never did. Not one time did he ever do anything by his own power. He did it in complete obedience unto the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And the reason he did that is because he is our father in the faith. In plainer words, he's the one who begat us. And we do everything we do by the power of the Holy Spirit of God in obedience to the Father. So he couldn't do many mighty works, limited because of unbelief. Is unbelief a limiting factor then? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the book of Hebrews talks about an evil heart of unbelief. So is unbelief therefore involved? Uh, can it, could it be involved therefore in your healing? Absolutely. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 29, the Bible said, He that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now what cause is that? It's called the discernment of the Lord's Supper. You can get into the story and read it for yourself. The rich were gathering unto themselves, and the poor to, uh, unto themselves, and, and they were having a feast day out of it. 
And then uh, they went into the Lord's Supper and gave no more respect and honor to it as they did with their feast day. And God smote them. He said, there are many of you sickly. So could it be that uh, this discerning of the Lord's body could be, uh, could be a broader thing than that? In other words, could God bring sickness upon someone for, for disobedience? He certainly could. In 2 Timothy 4.19, salute Prisca and Asella, Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. The Apostle Paul said that he had left one of his faithful servants with him in the ministry. He had left him sick, so he had not been healed. Now, in Philippians 2.25, notice how personal it gets with the Apostle as to one of his sick brethren. Philippians 2.25. You need to read this one with me because this is important. Philippians 2.25. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness, because that ye had heard that he had been sick. This is a man with compassion. For indeed, the apostle says, he was sick nigh unto death. Notice the sickness on a faithful servant of the Lord. The sickness had come upon him. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but in me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. <clears throat> I sent him therefore the more carefully, that when ye see him again you may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation. Because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life. He had ruined his health in serving the Lord, and the Lord did not stop him from doing that to supply your lack of service toward me. And so I don't know if it was a matter of going without rest, going without food, or, or just pushing himself to the limit, but whatever it was, it had emaciated his body and brought him to a state where he was almost dead. And the Apostle Paul could not stand the thought of losing him and so obviously he prayed, and God had mercy on him. Now what had happened here with uh, Epaphroditus is that he had fallen prey to the natural ravages of the body. You see, <coughs> the natural ravages of the body. You have to take care of that body. There are certain things you do to take care of it, certain things that, that, uh, that, uh, that will destroy it. If you smoke cigarettes, they'll kill you. That's simple. That's not a hard one. A cigarette, cigarette smoke is loaded with carcinogens. It's got almost as many as marijuana. So if you're smoking pot, that'll kill you too. A carcinogen is a cancer-causing agent. That's what it is. So when you're pulling that down into your body, you are, you are literally poisoning yourself every time you do it. How can you do that and think that's in the will of God? And all of the foods that we eat, we need to be very careful about what we take into our body. Very careful about it. And I would confess to you this morning that uh, this evening that I have as voracious an appetite as anybody. In other words, I like to eat too. <laughs> but you have to be sensible and you have, to, you have to know what you're doing to take care of this body. And if you don't take care of it, you'll pay a price. You'll pay a price. Why? Because the body's subject to the natural ravages of, 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 uh, of, uh, of, the, of the earth, of this world. This is what Epaphroditus suffered. He suffered the natural ravages of the body. He was nigh unto death because he did not take care of his body. He worked himself to death. So think about that for a moment. Just think about that. Take that into your heart and consider it, that you have to get so much rest and you have, to get, uh, you, have to, you have to be careful of what you do, where you go. You can't push yourself beyond the limit. Athletes, you may not know a whole lot about, they don't like to tell you this, but athletes die all the time because they cross the line. They push themselves. They push themselves. They cross the line. The body can only take so much. And for the first few decades of my life, I was an athlete. I ran track and played basketball. That's all I live. I live for basketball. That's it. Up and down that court, up and down that court, up and down that court. Hour after hour after hour after hour after hour. And, uh, and then when I got through with that, I started running. I ran all over this place. I've been on a road around here. I know every road, every alley. 
Every dog, I know all the dogs. <laughs> Run up and down these roads. For years and years and years, I rode a bicycle up and down these roads, up and down these roads, 21 miles. The other day I was talking about, told you I did it in 45 minutes. I don't know what I was thinking about. I didn't do 21 miles in 45 minutes. It took about an hour and 10 minutes to do 21 miles. Now, some of these that run the Tour de France over there, I guess they might be able to do it, but I can't. But we had, good, we had a lot of good exercise. I mean, I exercised. We exercised. We literally stayed on, for years, I was on, a, on an exercise regimen, and I stuck to it. I stuck to it. And we went out there, and we rode, and we ran, we rode, we ran, we rode, we ran all over this place. But it still did not stop the ravages of time. A year ago, I came down with a heart problem. My cholesterol was low. My blood, I've never had a blood pressure problem. None of these things. The flesh is subject to decay. That's just the bottom line. And, you know, I'm not saying don't exercise, but I am saying that some things, it's absolutely, you're not going to change. And it didn't change with me. So, what does that mean? That means God gave you a body, take care of it. You only got one. And something, and the Bible says, bodily exercise profiteth a little, it profiteth for a little while, is what it means. You can get yourself in all kinds of shape, but it won't last. It won't last. So, that's to be considered when you talk about healing, divine healing. Do I believe in divine healing? Absolutely. I'm going to show you something about it right here in a minute. Do I believe in it? You better believe I believe in divine healing. Do I believe God works miracles? Absolutely. I absolutely I've seen God perform miracles. And when I pray, I look forward for a miracle. I pray anticipating a miracle. I pray anticipating God Almighty healing someone. I pray toward that end. So the Bible says over here in Philippians 2.25, in 1 John chapter number 5, verse 16, though, it says, If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. Notice the wording, unto death. See? Sin that leads up to death. In other words, it looks like a progressive thing, doesn't it? Sinning a sin that leads to death. So it implies that the manner of death could very well be sickness that comes on because of some sort of sin that an individual may be practicing in their life. See what I mean? I'm not saying that that's absolutely the case, but it's, 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 it's possible, very possible. I do not say to pray all unrighteousness is sin and there's a sin not unto death. Now, of course, the Apostle John in, in 1 John deals with sin in all three aspects, as I've told you before. Sin as it relates to the spirit, sin as it relates to the soul, and sin as it relates to the body. And all three of these are dealt with. The apostle does, does, a, uh, does a marvelous job in, in opening up each one of them. In 1 Timothy 5, verse 23, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Notice the terminology, often infirmities. It's obvious that the infirmity has something to do with the physical condition of your body. And he said, take a little wine for it, for your often infirmities. So the wine we're talking about is the wine of 2,000 years ago. It's not Jack Daniels down here at the local uh, package store, liquor store, they call them now. They don't call them package stores anymore, do they? I think they call them liquor stores now. And do they? I don't, I forget what, when they first came, listen, I've been in Knox County all my life. You wouldn't believe what a dog fight they had when they first brought liquor into this county back in the 50s, late 50s. There was a dog fight. And they brought it in, and I remember the first package stores that opened up, and what that meant was that the bootleggers lost business. <laughs> that's, that's what it meant. Because they'd, they'd been buying moonshine from the bootlegger, and they'd been buying the bonded liquor from the bootlegger for a long time. And uh, as you know, the, the, the bootlegger has been, was, was selling moonshine that's been made in the mountains here in East Tennessee and Western Kentucky and West Virginia and all around here. And probably there's still a lot of moonshine stills up there in, the, in, in these hills that they don't even know about. And when they find one, tear it down, it doesn't take them long to build another one back. So moonshine is the heritage of East Tennessee, Western North Carolina, West Virginia, Virginia, all this area in here. 
And the bootlegger sold, uh, this is probably for the younger kids because you older folks, you know what I'm talking about, but the bootlegger sold liquor. Uh, he sold moonshine liquor and he, show, he sold bonded liquor uh, without a license and the state didn't get its taxes and so they called him a bootlegger. They used to carry it in their boots years ago and pull it up out of their boot and that's uh, where they got the terminology. And so they were, there was quite a business going on back in those days, quite a business. You could always tell where a bootlegger lived because of the traffic constantly. <laughs> he had a lot of friends <laughs> coming and going from his or her place of business. I'll guarantee you one thing, uh, what well, they call him John Barleycorn, alcohol, it has sure put the, it has sure uh, loaded a lot of fresh graves, hasn't it? Early graves. You better believe it. You better believe it. You better believe it. It sure has. Isaiah chapter number 53 and verse number 5 says this, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes, now notice this is 700 years before Christ, we are healed. Now, in verse number 4 of Isaiah 53, Surely he hath borne our griefs. The Hebrew word translated griefs is koli. And that word is translated most of the time in the Old Testament as sicknesses. The reason I say this is because I'm going to go back and quote Matthew chapter number 8 as it relates to this. Look at it again. Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. We didn't do it. God did it. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now go to Matthew chapter number 8 and verse 14. And watch how Matthew the publican applies this scripture. He quotes Isaiah 53 verse 4, and he makes an application of it. It's a wonderful study to watch how the New Testament writers apply Old Testament Scripture. Matthew 8, 14. When Jesus was coming to Peter, Peter's house and saw his wife's mother laid, Peter was married. If Peter was the first pope, he was a married pope. That's, he had, you can't get a mother-in-law any other way. He was married. <laughs> okay. As far as I'm concerned, Peter was not a pope but I'm just saying that tongue in cheek. He saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. Here's sickness, bodily sickness. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she arose and ministered unto them. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick that it might be, now watch this application of the Old Testament, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Esaias the prophet saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our what? Okay. Now there's a great argument as to whether or not healing is in the atonement. Folks, everything is in the atonement. <laughs> How could anything be outside of the atonement? How could anything be set right, exist, or have anything of meaning at all outside of the atonement? When the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross, the Bible said God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Sin. What is the ultimate end of sin? Death. And the body begins to die many times by sickness. Sometimes the body dies because the body is in some kind of a catastrophic event, some kind of, they call it trauma, what have you. Most of the time, the body wears down and the body is full of sickness, diseases. Then it dies. Where did the diseases come from? 
Was there, was there disease in the world before Adam sinned? No. No. Sin, therefore, is the, gave, gave birth to sickness. Adam lived 930 years. 930 years he lived. He lived a long time, but he died. It doesn't tell you what precipitated their death, but they died in the book of Genesis. He died, and he died, and he died, and he died. Only one man did not die in Genesis, in, the, in Genesis uh, before the flood. Uh, they call him antediluvian. And who was that? Enoch. Enoch, and his name means initiation, teaching. God's going to instruct us with Enoch. He didn't die. He was translated that he should not see death. It says that plainly, that he should not see death and was no more, for God took him. He was gone. Elijah is another peculiar situation. Elijah and Elisha are walking together. They're talking to each other. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the, this ball of fire appears, and it's chariot, and it has horses of fire. Horses of fire. And the Bible said it aparts them asunder. And Elijah goes up into heaven in a chariot, led or pulled, drawn by horses of fire into heaven. So he didn't die. If he died, the only, the only thing that he left behind when Elijah went up, do you remember what, what exactly? It came falling down. <laughs> it came falling down. And that was for Elisha. So he didn't see death. Now, Elijah has got to be a type of something, and Enoch has got to be a type of something. What's Enoch a type of? He's a type of the body of Christ because he's raptured out, he's caught up, he's caught out before the judgment comes in, you see. But Elijah's the one, he said, who shows up. He said, I'll send you to Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord. He therefore represents a remnant of Israel. He's got to in the tribulation period. He's got to represent that. He's got to be a type of it, of the Jew, because Elijah is directly connected with the Jew no, and Israel. No doubt about that. But he bare our sicknesses in his body on the tree. He bare them. And by his stripes, we were healed. Now, somebody come along and then they'll say, well, then it's God's will for us always to be healed. But the problem is, when you, read, when you make a statement like that, you hear the statement. I've heard the statement many times. I've researched it, read it on the Internet, read everything anybody has to say about it. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. But that does not say anything about healing. That just simply says He changes not. He changes not. Now, my desire and my wish tonight would be that God did heal everybody. And you better believe that when I was lying flat on my back, that I was praying for God to heal me. And when I go into that closet every day in my prayer closet, I cry out to God, Lord, my life is in your hands. I live if you say I live. If you don't say I live, then I don't live. I pray unto you that you give me life. My life comes from Him. Whether my life is in this world or in the world to come, I know whom I, know whom I have believed. Now that's a theoretical thing to most people until you face death. Until you face it. I had a brother call me just a few minutes ago, right before service tonight. He said they found a large tumor on his thyroid gland, and they think it's cancerous. The doctor told him, said, if you have to have cancer, that's one of the best places to have it, because if we take that thyroid out, unless it's metastasized, you're pretty good shape. We can get it out of your body. So hopefully that's the case with him. But he's been through a lot of stuff. I'll talk about him when we get into our prayer request here in a few minutes. But he needs prayer. He wants the church to pray for him because he's facing death. He may be dying. And it's not a joke. It's not, it's not a joke. When it comes down to your children, your wife, your husband, your mother, your father, your health, then you want to know what you believe, don't you? The problem is that to come across to you like, well, now, you're healed. You're not healed because you don't have enough faith or you don't have the right kind of faith, or your faith is not directed the right way, or whatever. Many, a, a lot of different takes on it. Switch completely puts the blame on you. That puts an enormous burden on you. 
for you to think that you're not going to be healed because the problem is you. The Bible won't bear that out. But what the Bible will bear out, as I said to you a moment ago, is that healing is in the atonement. And anything in the atonement is approachable to God. And it is covered by the blood. Because the blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior, was shed at the cross to make the propitiation for the atonement. In other words, the covering of the mercy seat. The helasmus, it's called in the New Testament. It's the blood applied to the mercy seat where God dwells between the cherubim and He can issue mercy to those who come by faith and believe Him. That mercy is the salvation of the sinner's soul, but it could be the healing of his body too because it all comes through the grace of God and what the provision made by our Lord Jesus Christ. So you can cry out to Him. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, he said, I, I, he said, I tried, he, he said, I, for three, three times, I, thrice, I asked the Lord to remove this, this, uh, this, this uh, uh, thorn in the flesh. And after the third time, God said, my grace is sufficient. Now, nobody knows what that is. I've heard a lot of people say, well, it was because he, was, he had a heart of hearing. Some say Paul had a real problem with pride and this and that, all kinds of conjectures and so forth and so on. Nobody knows exactly what it was. It could have been an affliction in his body. It could have been, it could have been an affliction that uh, affected him greatly. I don't know what it was, folks. It's, there's, no need, there's no need to speculate. But the bottom line is three times he asked God to remove it, and the Lord said, My grace is sufficient. So he had to live with it. Now sometimes that happens to God's people. They have to live with things that they don't want to live with. You wouldn't choose to live with it. <clears throat> I listen to the Catholics a lot. I try to get a take on what, how they, their perspective on what they're trying to say and where they're coming from. I don't know if you know what's going on with this new Pope Francis, but he's over there now telling them that, uh, that the Vatican is, uh, that the, that the uh, what do you call that thing? The, the, where all the cardinals come together. The what? Well, it's, it's, there's a name he gave to it. it yeah, the College of Cardinals, but there's a name he gave to it. But anyway, he said it's as rotten as, to paraphrase him, he said it's rotten. <laughs> he said, he said to, to paraphrase him, he said you're a bunch of pompous people walking around with a little group following along behind you, pumping up your ego all the time. And this is what this Pope's saying. Can you imagine? He said, you cardinal, he said, here you're walking around, you got all these people running around behind you, you know, bootlicking so they can come up the ladder, and they've got you all pumped up, and you think you're something great. And he implied that you need to get out of there and start serving the people. And so they don't like Francis. <laughs> but in any event, I listened to one the other day talking, and they said that we must choose to share in the sufferings of Christ that by choosing to share in the sufferings of Christ, we can manifest Christ to the world. So therefore we must choose to live a life of, uh, of uh, deprivation and, and extreme service. And by doing that, that we continue the sacrifice of Christ in this world. Now here's, here's the problem, all right? When somebody comes to your door and knocks on your door, and they're, uh, they're witnessing to you, they hand you an awake or watchtower. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. All right. It's not because they're concerned for your soul. It's self-serving. They're working for themselves. You just happen to be the object that receives whatever they're doing. It's a very selfish thing. You see what I'm saying? The motive is not as pure as it looks because it is self-serving. This is their effort to get into heaven. And anything that you do, that if you think that what you're doing is earning you grace with God and earning you a, earning you a, a position with the Lord and acceptance in the sight of God, it's you doing it. It's a self-serving thing. It's very selfish. If what you're doing is the grace of God working out through you. The Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So the cavalier Calvinist that, uh, that sits back in his election 
And there's plenty of them around. And they turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. There's no fear and trembling with these people. Your salvation's a big deal, folks. Where you're going when you leave this world is a big deal. I believe in eternal security, but I'll tell you right now, most of the people that I know that believe in eternal security are sitting on their eternal security. And it doesn't motivate their lives. You see, we're just like every other church. We've got, we've got Sunday morning one hour pilgrims. I'm not being mean. We're glad they come. You, did you catch what I said? We're glad they're here. Good to have you back for an hour. Come on in. But the kids that are growing up in the church, they look at this. They watch this. You see what I mean? Now, a lot of folks are hindered because of work and various things. I know that. I know that. It's when you, which the, him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. Everybody's life's not the same thing. I know that. And some folks, they may be, they may be in a situation where they can't come but one time a week. Who knows? I don't know. I'm not the judge. But I'm sure we've got a number of them that could come more. And uh, it doesn't seem there's much fear and trembling going on. There's nothing serious about their salvation. If you're not in a prayer closet every day or reading that book, trying to get a hold of God and find out what God's will is for your life and the power of the Holy Spirit moving in your soul, there's not a whole lot of real fear and trembling going on. There's cavalier Calvinism is what you got. I'm not a Calvinist. Cavalier Calvinism. Fear and trembling means that, Lord, I know I'm saved, but thanks be unto God, I want to please you. I want the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. I want power in my life. Lord, give me grace and give me direction. Give me unction. This is a serious thing. Now, there's one thing the Catholics say that I like. They say it all the time. You say, what's that? They say, preach. Preach. Preach, preach, preach. And if you have to, use words. That's pretty good. I got a thing from a lady on, my, on, the, on the Internet. On the Internet. I've got some stuff on there. I got, a la oh, I got one from a woman in Zambia. It's, it's horrible what this woman's enduring. And you get on the website. You'll see it from Zambia. But I got one from a lady who said she married a preacher. She married a preacher. And now this preacher gets on to her because she's too holy. She wants to go to church too much. She wants to read her Bible too much. She's getting too serious about this stuff. That's what I'm talking about. He's a Cavalier Calvinist. You know who the Cavaliers were, the three musketeers, feather in the hat. Have you remember in Civil War, uh, Jeb Stewart? His name was J-E-B. I forget what that represented, each one of those letters, but they just put the letters together to make a name. Jeb Stewart. He was a cavalry commander. He was Lee's eyes at Gettysburg that didn't show up. And so Lee lost his, rec his reconnoitering, his, his eyes. He lost it. Well, Jeb Stewart was a cavalier. They had a lot of cavaliers in the Civil War on both sides. And he was a cavalier. What do you mean by that? He had a feather in his hat. Come, would you like to go to war with a feather in your hat? If, if you were the enemy, I'd take aim at that feather. <laughs> It's the attitude that you take toward your salvation. Your salvation's a big deal. It ought to be something lived out in your life every day you live. Every breath you take. It's serious business. The Baptist church has got too many backsliders out here that never backslid from anything. But in any event, that'll, that'll bring us down to this point. The Bible says in James 5, if there be any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. That's a direct commandment. That's not a suggestion. If there be any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. What are you doing? 
You're appealing to the same atonement that saved your soul. You're appealing to the blood-bought sacrifice at Calvary that saved you. When you cry out to God to heal you, you're crying out to the same one who did at the same place what was necessary not only to save you, but heal you. So what if he doesn't? That's God's business. That's as far as I go. That's his call. But I'll take you as far as I can take you, and I'll take you right up to the very place and anoint you and cry out to God and ask Him to save you in the name of Jesus and pray for, uh, and heal you and, 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 uh, and, and cleanse your body of whatever disease you may have, affliction, whatever. I'll be right there with you and pray for it to happen. Amen. Then it goes into His hands. It goes into His hands. That's what I believe. That's where I deviate from a lot of Baptists. They don't believe that. Say, why? Well, they'll say, Lord, if it be thy will. You say, well, if you pray that, that's okay. But what did the Lord Jesus Christ do at the Garden of Gethsemane? I learned a lesson from that one time. I really did. Uh, I learned a very deep lesson from that. He went back three times. Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. All right. After the third time, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, after that third time, the Apostle Paul said, I went three times. After that third time, he didn't give up the first time, second time. After the third time, the Lord Jesus came back and said, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He didn't say it after the first time or the second time, but the third time. When his will and the Father's will were brought together and the Son acquiesced or accepted the Father's will. It was the man Christ Jesus who for the things set before him while he was in the flesh feared not the death at the cross. He feared what he began to experience when he was becoming sin for us who knew no sin. That the waves of the rage of Almighty God in punishment of sin itself, he himself had become sin. And that he had to experience within his own soul. When thou shalt make my soul or his soul a sacrifice for sin or an offering for sin, thou shalt see the travail of his soul. God Almighty could look into his soul. He could look into the depths of his being. God the Father in heaven, that invisible being, that eternal absolute being that has never become flesh, but through the Son He became flesh. By experiencing what He experienced, God the Father acquired the knowledge and glory of what a man would feel because it's His man experiencing that wave after wave after wave of unbelievable horror that was coming on the Son of God. And the Bible said he was heard in that he feared, and he was delivered, not from the cross, but he was delivered from the condemnation and hell that he had sunk into, into the lowest of it. He drank its dregs to the bottom, took everything that could possibly be given, and God raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand. And now in the power of Melchizedek, a priest after the order of Melchizedek, the power of an endless life. He is able to minister grace to us, whether it be salvation, deliverance, healing, whatever we need. It was all bought and paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ. So I assure you tonight, folks, don't give up. And if you deal with doctors long enough, you're going to find doctors don't agree with each other. I hadn't been in that hospital any time out there at North Knoxville. When I had one cardiologist come in and told me I needed this done, and another one walked in right behind him and said, we don't need to do that, we need to do this. I listened to stuff like that. I caught it real fast, real quick. I found out that they don't always agree about the manner of treatment, what have you, what have you. I'm not being critical, I'm being observant. What's that mean? They're human beings. They're men and women. If you need to be healed tonight, put your trust in God and look at the doctor as an instrument in the hands of God. I'll close with this. I just went through my computer and had to reformat my hard drive. I got a bunch of junk on there. I couldn't even load a program, wouldn't even start. So I just had to go wipe everything out. 
and I put a new I put a new wallpaper. You know what wallpaper is on a computer? That's when you pop, when you bring it up. Your wallpaper is what you're looking at. Well, I don't know why I hadn't seen it before, but here's this beautiful thing. It's a photograph of the Earth, taken from just high enough above to where you can see the circle, you can see the atmosphere, and then you can see the blackness of space. You can look down through the clouds and you can see the rivers. I mean, you can just see the swirling of the cloud. It's a beautiful thing. I sat there and I just stared at that and I thought to myself, how in the world can somebody look at that and not believe there's a Creator? Surely you don't believe that's an accident. I mean, it's just everything's perfect the way God made it. Beautiful. This earth from space is a beautiful thing till you get on down in it. And see those little people running around down there. And what they're doing to each other. And then it kind of takes the beauty away, doesn't it? Well, that's what God does for your life. That's what He does for your body. Use the doctor, but put your trust in God. Yes, Father, in thy name we pray. For Jesus' sake I ask it. Amen. All right, let's see here tonight. We've got... To